distinguished speaker and academician, Professor M. R. K. Prasad, sir. I would like to send a very warm welcome to Dr. Prasad on behalf of Sharda University and participants of this FDP. Dr. Prasad is currently working as a principal of V. M. Salgaonkar College of Law, Punjab, Goa. Dr. Prasad is a leading expert in clinical education in India. He is the first scholars from USA in clinical education. Dr. Prasad is the expert of moving legal aid alternate dispute resolution to name few. Let me tell you, dear friends, under the leadership of Dr. Prasad, India's first legal aid clinic was set up and he, he received Institutional Excellency Award and Menon Institute of Legal Advocacy Training Award for the same. Sir has mentored many teams who has participated in various moot court competition, alternate dispute resolution competition in USA, Hong Kong, Vienna, etc. Most welcome, sir. We all are keenly waiting to hear you. Uh, over to you, sir. Dr. Prasad, Thank most you. welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, give me a second, I would be sharing my PowerPoint. Brother Tiji, you are requested to show. Uh, that is sharing by himself, ma'am. Okay. 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 Fine. Can you see my uh, the slides? Yeah, yes, it's sir. visible, sir. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, good morning to everyone and. Uh, I have spoken at length about clinical legal education from the last few weeks. Maybe this is the eighth or ninth webinar, and if somebody might have attended uh, earlier, there could be some repetitions. So I'm trying my best level not to repeat the same, but obviously certain things could be uh, uh, could not be avoided to repeat. So this is how my schema presentation goes. First, we will discuss the concept of clinical legal education in India. Uh, under that, we would understand why clinical legal education, what does it mean? And then we will uh, go to what are the efforts made in India in institutionalizing this clinical legal education? I mean institutionalizing in a sense that how law colleges have internalized these clinical legal education in their uh, curriculum. Then I will briefly talk about what are the current trends in India. Then I will come to uh, any law college wishing to establish clinics. Uh, what we should do, how we should start, and then we will also look into what are the challenges and opportunities that we have in institutionalizing clinical legal education to create better legal professionals who are professionally competent and socially relevant okay so just to give an idea how this clinical legal education started uh, the idea was coined by a Russian professor in 1901. If you look at in the medical profession, uh, the clinics are very prominent. So in a classroom as an MBBS student, you would study. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, it's showing bad network connectivity. Uh, in the medicine, first you learn uh, in theory in the classroom, and then you visit to 
the hospital to the college and you learn practical aspects of practicing medicine. So therefore, the idea came up, why can't we do the same thing in uh, legal education? So that is how the clinical legal education has started in early 19th century. And, uh, well, and over a period of time, they gained many popularity in uh, uh, many parts of the world. And America is a leading ex uh, example in clinical legal education. Now, what does what do we mean by clinical legal education is it's an educational activity in which the law students are performing some kind of task. Those tasks could be an actual task. That means you represent actually the cases in the court or maybe a simulations given by your legal uh, your law professors uh, based on what skills or what things that you are supposed to perform in the profession. That means. What are you going to do in profession? You are going to learn same thing uh, in the law college setup. So that is what in short sense clinical legal education is uh, learning by doing what lawyers are going to do in their profession. Right? Try to learn that in the law school setup. OK. Um, clinical legal education has about uh, three dimensions. One is clinical legal education as a pedagogy. What I mean by pedagogy is uh, clinical legal education is a methodology of teaching law. That is one dimension. That means clinical method of teaching is part of clinical legal education. And the idea of clinical legal education as a pedagogy is that when you are teaching substantive laws, instead of uh, confining only to lecture method, you may employ clinical method. A clinical method is much more effective than a lecture method. That means in one particular dimension of the clinical legal education is use it as a pedagogy so that the students learning is enriched with the practical aspects. Uh, let me give you a simple example. <laughs> Suppose you are teaching a constitutional law. You talk about uh, Article 17, the most neglected article in fundamental rights. We are talking. Uh, so when you are teaching Article uh, 17, that is untouchability, you may finish in 10, 15 minutes and the impact is much less. But suppose you ask the students to go to their community and ask the community people and find out what kind of untouchable practices are still prevailing in the society that they would remember longer. The concept of why. Uh, in fact, when I joined in the uh, Law College in Goa, uh, my students used to argue with me that there is no such uh, untouchability in Goa prevailing. But once we started these legal aid clinics and they used to go to the remote villages and talk to the community, they did find that certain caste people are not allowed to enter into temples, etc. So they able to connect what we teach in the uh, class, what happens in reality. So that's uh, clinical legal education as a pedagogy is a wonderful uh, method of teaching law. Now, the second aspect of clinical legal education is skill training. We all understand that legal education is a professional education. In a professional education, we need to give three types of things. One is you provide knowledge like any other liberal education. But the second part of of the professional education that is what deviates from uh, general education is skill part. That means in a profession, the student is supposed to learn certain skills that are required to make uh, to join in their profession. Therefore, how do we teach these skills? That's a major task for the law colleges. For example, advocacy skills, 
uh, interviewing skills, counseling skills, language skills, ADR skills. How are you going to impart uh, to the last students before they join the profession? So the method is the clinical method. So the clinical legal education works towards uh, imparting the skill training for the students. And unfortunately, most of the law colleges uh, overlook this aspect. Very few colleges offer. The mostly what we offer is only the, the on the name of clinic, clinical teaching, we offer moot court. But the moot court is not sufficient to provide the range of skills that a lawyer is required. Now, the third dynamic legal education is uh, the clinical legal education has a potential to improve access to justice. Now, if you look at the Indian scenario, uh, free legal aid is a fundamental right in case of uh, all criminal trials. If the accused is not in a position to afford for a lawyer. Similarly, even under the civil law to a large extent, they do provide, or the state is under the obligation to provide free legal aid. But if you look at the National Legal Service Authority, the Legal, sorry, the legal Service Authorities Act, uh, particularly this section 12 says that uh, if you read that section carefully, more than 70% of Indian population are eligible for legal aid. Uh, simply, it says all women are entitled for legal aid. So about 50% of women, that means uh, imagine 1.3 billion and half of them uh, would be entitled for free legal aid from the state. Then you add to the workers, people who were displaced because of calamities, uh, children, etc. There's more than two thirds of this population in India is entitled for free legal aid. It's a gigantic task. I don't think the government is in a position to provide that. So therefore, through clinical legal education, law schools, uh, by establishing legal aid clinics, could access, could improve the access to justice to the people. That means through clinics, you also able to uh, provide some benefits to the community. So therefore, these are the three dimensions. One is uh, you learn better the law. Second one is you get, you get a skills training. Third one is it is also benefit the society if you start a clinic in your law school. Um, the clinical legal education in India has its roots with the legal aid and legal education reform. That means in India, at least the clinical legal education initially started not as a pedagogy, not as a skill training, but purely for the purpose of providing uh, benefit to the community. Uh, more or less the same in USA. Uh, initially, the clinic started as part of their legal aid obligation. But over a period of time in America now, in addition to this community angle, they also oh, put a lot of emphasis on skill development. But when it comes to India, we still look at clinic as a part of legal aid and legal education reform movement. Uh, this is the idea of clinic in, in India particularly is to help the people. Though while you are helping, you may get uh, your skills improved, but the major focus is for the society. So that's why you have to look at, there are three committees on legal aid in 70s and early 80s i would say this period is a golden period for the legal aid the first committee was uh, headed by the vr krishna justice krishna 1973 and second one is in 1977 uh, committee on national juridic care equal justice uh, and social justice and third is, is very very important is a SILAS, what we call uh, for implementation of legal aid schemes. Uh, Chief Justice P. N. Bhagavati is the chairman for this committee. Now, what these three committees uh, intended or uh, expected from the law colleges? Now, uh, I'm just 
just uh, put all three together uh, instead of separating each one uh, due to opacity of the time. Uh, it says you need to modify the law school curriculum to focus on the needs of the citizen. Now, this is one important aspect. Maybe 70s and 80s, the socialism is on peak. Therefore, we always look education as for the benefit of the society. Even today, I believe that the education is for the society, not for the industry. Now, industry may be benefited, but ultimately education need to be uh, useful for the society. It can be any education, not necessarily legal education. Therefore, the law school curriculum should look into what are the needs of the society and improve their curriculum. Second is the introducing the clinical legal education in the law schools. That means uh, they insist that every law school should have a legal aid clinic. And they want the law students to engage in the public services while they were studying law. Um, they also insist on uh, developing the cadre of clinical law teachers. This is one of the biggest problem in uh, India is that there are very few clinical law teachers. And in fact, what we expect is that every law school should have at least one uh, clinical law teacher. Unfortunately, it becomes a, a, a distant dream. Then they also proposed to amend the Advocates Act because we all know that neither law teachers nor law students can represent any client in the court. There is a restriction, unlike in America, whereas in the United States, the students could able to represent the clients under the supervision of the professors. And the professors are also allowed to practice in the court. Uh, but unfortunately in India that is not possible unless the Advocates Act is amended by the parliament. Then they, then they also, also uh, uh, somebody's, somebody's mic, mic is on. on. So, uh, so uh, I'm getting I'm an getting echo of my, please somebody, okay, right. Uh, the legal literacy projects, the three committees want the law schools to organize legal aid camps, uh, teach the people about law. Then they also talked about training the paralegals and uh, using the students to bring class actions like public interest litigation. So there is a lot of ideas that came up from these three reports. Now, how did we institutionalize clinical legal education? The first thing is till 1961, there is no standardized educa legal education in the country. The Advocates Act came in 1961 and made Bar Council of India, established the Bar Council of India and empowered the Bar Council of India to prescribe the standards of legal education in India. So over a period of time, Bar Council of India has brought several reforms in legal education. I think now more or less, more all the colleges are having the same curriculum number of years of for getting LLB degree, uh, what are the minimum subjects that they should be taught, etc. was structured by the Bar Council uh, from last 30, 40 years. But there are uh, two important reforms that the Bar Council trying to bring to institutionalize clinical legal education. The first one is uh, in 1997, Bar Council of India by a circular made uh, four compulsory subjects in all law courts. So therefore, uh, of course, this has come up because earlier the Bar Council of India has uh, insisted that one year practice after completing law before joining in the profession. So that was challenged by uh, the uh, challenger in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, though it's a good move, but Bar Council of India has no such powers. So it struck down that one year apprenticeship rule. And as a result, the Bar Council brought a new reform by way of introducing these four practical. Uh, the first the practical paper one is Moot Court and uh, uh, 
other aspects. Second one is uh, drafting, pleading, and conveyance. The third paper is uh, professional ethics. And the fourth paper is uh, legal aid, paralegal service, and uh, public interest in education. This is in 1997. So by 1997, the Bar Council of India says every law college should have a legal aid clinic. As a fourth practical paper is purely based on legal aid and public interest in education. That means all of a sudden, every law college requires a legal aid uh, cell. And most of the law colleges have no idea what to do, how to do, including myself. Uh, but if, because it is mandatory, we have to start, then we started our legal aid clinic. Um, then uh, it continued, most of the universities are unable to cope up with the clinical legal education because they don't have expertise. So. Uh, many universities converted the, all these four practical papers into any other substantial law paper and taught in the classroom. And assessment is at the end of the semester, you would have 100 marks written exam. That means the very purpose of creating this clinical legal education through these four practical papers was a very, very limited success. Only a few colleges could able to uh, practically provide these skills to the students. Uh, in 2008, the Bar Council of India and Rules of Legal Education again changed this uh, practical papers. Uh, they retained three practical papers and removed legal aid as a mandatory practical paper, added ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, as a fourth practical. Um, and what happened to the legal aid is they mentioned that the legal aid should be compulsory for the final year students. Therefore, every college should have a legal aid clinic. So what is the difference between 97 and uh, 2008 rules is that in 1997, it is mandatory subject legal aid. Therefore, teachers would get uh, academic credit for offering clinic and the students would get uh, marks that is again academic credit for the students. But now in 2008, it was removed. So therefore, now that neither the teachers nor the student get any academic credit for participation. So that disgraced a lot. So what we did expect from the clinical legal education, why do we introduce practical mentors, why we want clinical legal education is we, the, we expected clinical legal education would develop fundamental knowledge. It also would develop the skills that a lawyer is required. And most importantly, we want to improve the students in engaging complex issues because in the classroom, uh, we have compartmentalization of teaching. Contract teacher teaches contract, doesn't connect with CPC or any other subject. But in reality, cases comes before the lawyer are complex. They are not pure constitutional law case or pure contract case, pure company law case. So therefore, the students not able to understand the complex issues unless they are exposed to it. And uh, another important thing is the students to make judgments under un conditions of uncertainty. So for example, in the MOOC code, they only argue, but they don't decide. That means it's a very, very important decision, uh, sorry, skill for a lawyer to have a skills of decision making because they have to decide whether to file a case or not. They have to decide what facts to be produced before. If you become a judge, then the judge whole duty is to decide the cases. So therefore, making judgment is a skill that a lawyers are supposed to have. And also, the clinical legal education would have made the students how to learn from experiences. Please remember, Learning in a classroom has a very limited success. Um, but if you learn from the experiences by visiting to the legal aid clinics, your uh, learning experience is enhanced. And also, you all know that there are very few ethical values still remaining in the profession. So how do you make the students responsible and uh, 
ethical in the profession that responsibilities and ethical things can be taught well in the clinic setup and also the aim is we want to create professionally competent yet socially responsible lawyers that means making them smart making the students smart is not enough they must be uh, sensitive towards the community needs that's very very important and the clinical legal education also aims at benefiting the community uh, to give you an example uh, a student is not even aware that charging a percentage of winning proceedings is unethical because what they learn is they learn from the profession and in the profession it is rampant but bar council of india rules on ethics and also the indian contract act says you can't do that similarly how do you charge fee how much fees you should charge all these things are an ethical issue uh, what about your conflicting of interest uh, what you could disclose what you cannot disclose to the court all these things could be learned only in clinical setup but unfortunately what happened the colleges failed in institutionalizing clinical legal education there may be reasons reasons could be plenty i just put few uh why is that infrastructure so to run a clinic you need a space you need some infrastructure with a laptop it's a sorry a desktop with a printer some other furniture etc most of the law colleges doesn't have that much infrastructure and there is no financial aid but i believe that financial aid is not the only reason but Uh, many places this financial aid is also an issue the most important thing is the most of the faculty are just uh, academic teachers they don't have any background of practicing law so therefore there is no training for the faculty how to conduct the clinical activity in the law college and uh, even if you could take part time teachers the uh, advocates who could come and teach these things but the poor wage pattern particularly the all the government uh, faculties the wage is very poor uh, therefore it discourages the uh, lawyers to come to come back to law college and teach and uh, the biggest impediment i would see is that there is a lack of bar involvement by both the bar and bench see remember there is a responsibility for the bar associations and also the judges because they have to mold the younger generation is not the last school is not sufficient they should learn uh, many at, at many times uh, the senior advocates and some of the judges uh, often when i meet they always complain that the quality of legal education is poor um, then i ask them what could be their role to improve uh, for example i bring a bunch of students to the court after observing the court proceedings can the judge address them Uh, how the proceedings takes place they say they don't have time so if they don't have time uh, and completely the training is left to the teachers when the teachers are not completely equipped because they are not allowed to practice uh, the profession doesn't improve then the quality of the students because the large number of colleges maybe more than 1600 law colleges and some of the uh, cities have more than 60 law colleges so therefore everybody naturally gets into a llb degree and the llb degrees are run as a part time courses therefore uh, the quality of legal education uh, uh, is not very high and as a result clinical legal education requires more efforts so most of the colleges are not in a position to provide and i also wanted you to focus on why this clinical legal education is so important because if you look at the legal profession and the community there is a lot of disconnect there is a disconnect between lawyers courts judges and the community because the language that they use in the court is primarily english and the local uh, language is different being different the client doesn't know what the lawyer argued what the judge said maybe the examination of the witness takes place in the local language but ultimately all the documents are in english so the biggest disconnect between the litigant and the law is that the language is a barrier second thing is the vocabulary that we use 
simple thing like status quo, what the hell the status quo is for an ordinary man, doesn't know. So the vocabulary, the legal jargons that we use, uh, the public is not aware about that. Uh, then the orientation of legal education purely on litigation based is one of the biggest problem. Therefore, whenever uh, a litigant comes, uh, uh, sorry, whenever a client comes to the lawyer, the first thing that the lawyer would say, let us file a case. That means if you have hammer only in your hand and you have no other tools, every problem looks like a nail and you want to go on hammering the nail like this. But if you have other tools, then you will understand that litigation is not the only way. And most of these law colleges are in urban and the, even the education is urban centered focused or so because we always talk about appellate jurisdictions but not the trial courts and most of the law teachings are philosophical that means we teach abstract theories but not what practically important for example in a general principles of contract 80 percent of the 80 to 90 percent i would say the teaching would go on uh, the formation of the contract only 10 percent would be discussed on specific performance of the contract but when it goes to the profession, specific performance is much more focus is needed. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the values that the law college uh, promotes may not be synced with the values with the uh, thing. So therefore, the question is that I do see there is a large gap between uh, what we teach and what the profession requires. Now, the question that I am putting it here is, is law is an academic discourse or law is a profession which requires performance? All the teachers should ask this question to them. If law is an academic discourse, what we are doing is fine. We teach some abstract theories. But if you think that it is a profession that requires the performance, that means we need to change our teaching pedagogy. Similarly, the question is whether it is a law school or a lawyer school. That means whether uh, we think our college as a law college, therefore we teach you the abstract substantive law and we are not worried about your legal skills. You go and learn from the profession. Then what we are doing is fantastic. We are fine. But at least from last 10, 15 years, the idea of whether it is a law school or a lawyer school is settled. Now, nobody can afford to think that it is just a law school, but we have to admit whether you like it or not that it is a lawyer school. That means the law students are supposed to learn the skills that are required for the profession, at least to a large extent from the law school. I don't say that the law, the finished product of law school automatically go and practice straight away, but we need to reduce that gap between the profession and theory. Now, let me think about uh, uh, how do we do that? The first thing that we need to understand is that uh, law requires the skills, right? Therefore, first let us think about what are the skills that are required. If you want to be a lawyer, what skills you require? So law schools are supposed to identify those skills and prepare their curriculum to provide these skills. Unfortunately, we provide this uh, curriculum and then think what the curriculum is useful. So, uh, in fact, if there is a time I would have done that uh, with you all asking everybody to list out the skills because paucity of the time and also physical proximity uh, restrictions. I am just uh, enlisting these uh, skills for you. So these are some of the skills. There may be more. And unfortunately, if you see, there is not a single attempt made in India about identifying skills. And uh, the attempt was made in the American uh, scenario by MacRate report. If you type MacRate report in Google, you will get it. Um, they identified several skills that a lawyer required and requested the law schools to modify their curriculum to provide these skills. So, so now what is our duty? Now, if these are the skills that a lawyer required, 
how do we do it? So that means we have to identify the clinical activities to provide these kind of activities. Okay. Um, you could think of, for example, interviewing. Maybe you interviewing and counseling can be done by client counseling if you introduce it. Problem solving you can do by giving few problems. Okay. So I'm not giving what are the activities to be used for this. Maybe your seminar, your debates, mood court, uh, negotiation, mediation, simulations. All these things may give several of these skills. You have to think how to uh, offer. Now, as I said, the clinics are in India based on the legal aid. I'm going to start now how to start with legal aid clinics. But before doing that, please understand what do you mean by legal aid? We always think that legal aid means representing the client in the court. It's not. You remember those three reports that I discussed earlier. They identified about seven uh, components of legal aid. OK, so these are seven components of legal aid. Look at these seven. First one is legal representation. <coughs> Excuse me. Second one, legal advice. Third one is legal awareness. Fourth one is paralegal services. <coughs> Fifth one is public interest litigation. Sixth one is promoting alternative dispute resolution. Sixth one is law reform. Now, if you look at what is our excuse for not starting a legal aid clinic that we cannot represent the people. That is only the first one. What about the ingredients from seven uh, from second to seven. All these things can be undertaken by the law college without any problem. Even legal representation. Legal representation is not allowed in the courts, but legal representations are allowed in the tribunals. For example, consumer forum. In my law college, we have a consumer clinic. We won 25 cases. The students represent the clients under the supervision of the professor. Similarly, RTI Commission, you don't require to be a lawyer. Labor Commission. So there are many commissions where you need not be a lawyer. You could represent clients. So therefore, if you want to start a clinic, there are many, many methods by which you could offer these benefits to the students. Um, let me uh, Go to how do we establish because uh, time capacity. I'm just so. You are requested to check your mind. You are not audible. And we can not see PPT also like participants are requesting. If you can check. Yes, sir. Now it's visible, but I think your mic is muted. Yes, I'm muted and I'm just doing again so that it would be set. Um, OK, just a minute. Can you see now? Yes, sir, we can see now. OK. I'm sorry for that. I don't know what happened. Uh, so uh, what are we looking at uh, kinds of clinics? Uh, clients of clinics to clinics on campus and off campus. On campus clinics are that means the clinic is in your uh, college. Off campus means not in your college, but outside the college. What we should do off campus or on campus? that you have to decide depending upon the location of your college is it accessible if it is accessible to the people if it is in the community then fine but most of the premier law schools are 
away from the cities, away from the places. Therefore, anybody to visit their campus would be a problem. And another important thing is most of these colleges will have heavily guarded with a big gate and you have to write there why you are entering into campus, etc. The, all these kind of barriers to the access would restrict the people to access your legal aid clinics. Uh, most of us studied in public universities. Public universities are barrier free. Anybody used to walk in. But nowadays that's not happening in most of the educational institutions. Of course, my college is still uh, barrier free access. Anybody can walk into the campus. Uh, so therefore you should know whether you have those kind of restrictions to enter into your campus. Uh, off campus advantage is you can start the clinic where uh, the people have access to it. But the problem is somebody has to provide you that space. So in my college, we have both on campus and off campus. Uh, on campus, we have uh, about uh, three clinics, child rights clinic, disability clinic. Uh, we have about 25 off campus clinics works in uh, Panchayat buildings, municipalities, uh, schools, some of them are temples, some of them are in churches, etc. So therefore, where you get a space, uh, you could uh, decide if you want to off campus. I'm not telling you to do what you do. You decide according to your strengths and weaknesses of your law college. I'm just giving you an idea. So there must be a structure for the clinic. What is the structure? How many students you want in this clinic? In my clinic, not more than 15 students, one five. Uh, but if you want to have more than that, that is left to you. Then also you should know who would be the faculty in charge. And uh, in the structure, maybe what you need to do is there should be a student in charge for the cell, your legal aid clinic, and there will be a faculty in charge. Therefore, if the faculty want to communicate some information, they could tell the in charge of the student. And then the infrastructure, what infrastructure we need. Mostly you don't require much. You need a space of a physical space. Anyway, college would be having printers and uh, uh, desktops, etc. Maybe a storage, uh, a safe or something for keeping the files, which usually you find in the law colleges. You don't require a huge infrastructure for that. Maybe one of the desktop could be transferred to legal aid clinic and one, one printer can be given there and uh, it could be done. It's not that you need a huge infrastructure. But if it is an off campus clinic, then you need to see whether there is a place, there is a, st a place to sit and uh, some kind of a furniture is available, etc. Then you should have a functional time. Please remember you are not a full pledged law office. The student has to attend the classes, teacher has to teach. So therefore, you need to fix the clinic timing. Uh, for us, uh, our clinics works in the Saturday, every Saturday, three hours in the evening. Therefore, there is no clash with the classes. Uh, the students has to physically do, go to the clinic, therefore, uh, we have to do on Saturdays, but the specialized clinics usually works in the afternoon uh, three three times a week. Uh, so therefore you need to see what is your timing. You decide what time is useful for you can be affordable to you. And focus of the clinic. This is very, very important. When you are starting a clinic, what type of clinic, whether it is a general clinic, anybody can walk in and whether you would be able to provide information, advice, etc. or not. Or you may have a focus on a particular issue. For example, in our college, child rights clinic focus only child rights issues. They don't take any other thing. But the off campus clinics, they take any uh, any kind of issue. Uh, if you want to start, you didn't have a clinic or you have a clinic, but it is you think that it is not functioning well. What I would start you, what I would uh, suggest you is start a, a clinic purely on providing legal literacy to start with. You run at least a year. So what are you going to do under the clinic? You take few students and your target is to legal literacy, provide legal literacy to the 
community. If you don't want to go to community in the beginning, target the schools. Take some subject that is relevant to the school children and identify few students. Develop a small uh, presentation about 20, 20 minutes presentation. Ask your students to visit to the schools and make these presentations. Uh, teach the students about the law. Uh, for example, um, what happened is after this uh, POCSO Act came and then the JJ uh, Act, Journal Justice uh, Act was uh, uh, amended and they brought new act. Now and also there is a subsequent amendment to uh, Section 375 for the way. Now if you combine effect of all these three shows that if any child having a sex below 18 years, whether there is a consent, not a consent, it amounts to rape. So we found there are several cases in Goa because we are running child rights clinic. The, there is a love, uh, love angle, love affair between two kids below 18 years. They are maybe 10 standard, 11 standard uh, students about 16, 17 years of age. And they run away from home, both the boy and girl. Maybe after a few days, they were caught and they brought back. By the time they were saying that they got married, they had sex, etc. Now the problem is from the girl side, file a case against the boy for uh, rape. So, and rape being a heinous crime, according to Juvenile Justice Act, because it's more than seven years punishment, uh, there is a possibility that the child could be tried as an adult. Uh, because of Nirbhaya's case, we changed the rules. So therefore, this is a very precarious situation. Uh, both run away with the consent, but the law says that the boy is uh, liable for the rape. So these kind of things that comes to the clinic, then we realize that this is going to be an issue. So immediately, few students has prepared uh, on this aspect, went to schools, targeting from right from 8th standard to 12th standard, telling them what the law is and what they would impact, what, what impact it would have on them. Similarly, you can go to schools and talk about child abuse, etc. You can talk about uh, fundamental rights which are important for them. So it's a great way to start in a simple manner. Then over a period of time, you get a confidence then you would start. For example, you are going to the schools. Somebody will come to you, say that we have a problem with this. Then you may start on that area. So slowly you could improve and it is it doesn't require any fund. All of you could start legal literacy clinics immediately without much difficulty, much difficulty. And this could be extended from schools to government employees to various things. I'll give you another example. Maybe you could undertake a small research on how many colleges and schools in your own vicinity has this uh, com internal complaints committee under sexual uh, prevention of sexual harassment act. Uh, whether they are proper, whether they are conducting properly or not, you have an expertise. So you could start counseling them and telling them how to start internal complaints committee. So there are way better things you could do once you start. Okay. Then the next area is the visibility of the clinic. Once you start the clinic, then you need to advertise about your clinic, uh, use social medias, use TVs or any other method that you, you could able to, to advertise about your clinic. And next thing is that you need to train the students. That's very, very important. You cannot start clinic without training the students. Okay, funding, I don't think you need much funding for the clinical activity. In fact, I don't have any funding. I, I charge the students for legal aid membership and with that money we used to conduct. And I used to conduct legal literacy programs within 1000 rupees. And that kind of money can be generated very easily. And you need to have collaborations with other colleges uh, and you could develop networking and also need based approach. That means what the community require based on that your clinic should uh, 
provide solutions. Uh, you could uh, look into some model programs and please have a realistic goals. We are not lawyers. We will not give if the case is involving to go to the court. We are not in a position to do that. So we may request them to go to a lawyer. If they cannot go to a lawyer, we will try to get them a free legal aid under the legal services. That much restriction. And also remember students will have two months examination, vacation. You may not be able to work. All these limitations you must understand. I'll try to finish and I'll give you some time for your class uh, for questions. What are the challenges? It's very difficult for the, every college um, uh, to start full pledged legal activities that we need to understand. So what we need, we need to redesign our curriculum. We need to oh, identify how do we shape the future lawyers. Um, we need to experiment on legal education. Um, and these are some of the challenges that we have. Uh, we need to bring re uh, curriculum reforms. Uh, we need to increase public funding in legal aid. We need collaborations. And particularly teachers will have a challenges. How do we meet unmet legal needs, particularly in rural areas? That's a challenge for us. As a law teacher, how are we going to use our law students to meet, to prepare these law students to meet these legal needs? And please remember, once the student undergo the clinical activity, they are much more sensible when they become lawyers. So now I don't have absolutely any problem uh, in case uh, I want some pro bono cases to be taken. My my students who are practicing the court, they are happy to do that. Um, just to give you an idea, this is a Goa map. You could see that there is uh, circles of uh, pink color. That is the areas where my legal aid cells work. OK, so thank you very much. I leave it for any questions. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would request participants. They can ask, they can post their questions. OK, I already seen one question uh, Dr. Nataraj, Nataraju has asked. Is there any appeal to the government for allowing law teachers to practice in law courts to get pra practical exposure? Um, there were many efforts were made to the government and uh, to the to amend uh, Advocates Act, but I don't see anything that is going to happen in your future. So need not worry about practicing in the courts. I had given you ample uh, examples. You don't require to go to court. Uh, there are other avenues where your students can actually represent students. Uh, there is another question, uh, Dhiraj Bhushan. What is the role of legal service authority to improve clinical legal education? Uh, in fact, I could speak an hours together on that. Unfortunately, their role was very, very limited, even though the act says that they are supposed to uh, strengthen the legal aid clinics uh, in the schools, uh, particularly look into Section 4 of the Legal Service Authorities Act. And in fact, most of the legal service authorities get a lot of funding from the central government. But unfortunately, they don't spend that money and uh, there are very, very few legal service authorities have collaborations with the law school. Same in Goa, we don't have any great relationship with legal service authority. In, uh, I had a survey. Uh, it would be available. You could type on UNDP survey on le law school based legal aid clinics in India. I conducted this project in seven states, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, um, Uttar, pra Uttar Pradesh, Orissa, um, and I, I forgot a few more states. And we found that in all states, not a single legal service authority is supporting law school clinics. It's very unfortunate. Any questions? Yes, sir. There is another question. They're asking, sir, is there any handbook you have uh, developed to implement uh, clinical legal education? Uh, unfortunately, not. We don't have any handbook, but there are few handbooks that are available from uh, United States of America. They can uh, 
looking to the American Bar Association website, there is a whole uh, section is uh, particularly uh, dedicated for clinical legal education. Um, I have seen another question, how to generate interest among the students about legal aid clinics. Uh, see, I don't see there is a much challenge because it's compulsory for them. All the final year students has to compulsory do it. Therefore, they have to do it. So you could say that their degrees would be not valid if they don't do it. Therefore, everybody will come out. I think there is some network issue. We have already posted some questions on the on the proper place. Kindly ask them as well. One second. One second. One second. Please answering. Sir, are you with us? There is some network issue. Professor Prasad, are you with us? You can wait for a moment. Yeah, we can wait. I think we got some network issue. Uh, Ritu, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Prakriti ji. Yes, my order, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sir's connection has been lost. Wi-Fi. Uh, he won't be able to rejoin, sir. Okay, fine. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Okay, fine. It was a very informative uh, session. Yeah. It, it it was a wonderful session, like, like very, very practical and uh, like he explained so well. And I think all of us, all law, uh, law colleges uh, are lacking in clinical legal education and it's a great information. I must sh uh, share my vote of thanks to May. So can... Uh, can we end this session then? Okay, thank you everyone. Yes. Thank you.